so good to see you all here this morning. Go ahead and take a seat. Welcome to Mission Community Church. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here of the church. And whether you're a new guest, allow me just take a minute to especially welcome you here this morning. Thanks for being with us to, to worship with us and hear from God's word this morning. If you're a regular attender, so good to see you all here today. And, and maybe you're tuning in online. Thanks for tuning in. And it's great to have you here this morning. We're in a seven week or part seven of our our series called the Apostles Creed and and uh, we're, we're taking it taking the Creed and we're, we're looking at line by line and unpacking it and and seeing what that all says and, and as I'm saying this the the buckets are going around because we had failed to mention that earlier with the offering Rob jumped the gun on me so I was, I was trying to set you up there Rob but that's all right um, we're, we're going through the Apostles Creed and we've been taking this line by line unpacking it and and what we have to realize is, is that the Apostles' Creed, there's another creed that's fairly popular called the Nicene Creed. These, these summary statements of faith served as really the rule of faith, the standard of faith for the early church because it, it was several hundred years before the Bible, the, the compiled word of God came together. And, and even when the Bible came together, it was so hard to get your hands on it because it was all, you know, papyrus and and there's all limited copies, and it wasn't until the, the mid-1400s when Gutenberg came out with his press and, and, and made the Bible even more readily available to average people like you and me. And so in the beginning of the church, there was this, this rule of faith, these creeds that served as, as summary statements of the Christian faith. And what's good for us is just to remind ourselves what it is that is essential when it comes to our beliefs as Christians. Because I don't know about you, in, in this world today, in this culture today, I'd much rather be known for what we are for rather than what we are against. I mean, there is enough divisiveness out there today, whether it, it's politics, whether it's denominations, whether it's sports teams on the other extreme of that. But, but what is it that, that tethers us to the essentials you know, what is our core beliefs as Christians? And so if you are able, I'm actually going to have you get some exercise in today and stand with me one more time. As we recite the creed together, um, a creed that has been recited for almost 2,000 years. I mean, just getting your mind around that for a second. But this is something that's been going on for, for quite a long time. And so if you would, let's join together as we recite this together. Whenever you're ready. I believe in God the Father Almighty. So today we're going to be focusing on this phrase, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I wonder in just saying that phrase, how many of you are here today kind of a little anxious about where I might be going here this morning when we talk about the Holy Spirit. That you're, you're trying to figure out, okay, wh what type of church are you when we talk about the Holy Spirit? I believe and the Holy Spirit. And, and as I even, like this whole week, just trying to get my mind around where I believe God wants to take us even this morning. And, and as a church, it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to grasp all these different concepts and truths about the Holy Spirit and, and, and bring that into a nice little 30, 35 minute message. And I feel like sometimes like I have a little glass water jar trying to capture the entire ocean. There's just so much out there and so much truth and, and so much kind of foundation around the Holy Spirit that to, to try to encapsulate that in a 30, 35-minute sermon is, is, is impossible. And so 
there's going to be things that I don't touch on today. There's going to be things that I do touch on. And, and, and there's all kinds of in-between as I start to talk about the Holy Spirit and try to teach us and, and challenge us in the Holy Spirit. So just have, have some grace for me. But then at the same time, let's continue this discussion. And so as you have questions that come up, I, I love to engage in conversation around, you know, all kinds of things regarding theology. It's, it's how we continue to grow as, as Christians. But I also at the same time don't want us to be scared of it either, some of these topics. One of the pastors that I followed growing up, uh, a lot of the books that I read is a man by the name of A.W. Tozer. He was born in the late 1800s and and died in 1961. He served as a pastor in Chicago for for a good amount of time. And one of the things I love about A.W. Tozer is that he's an uneducated preacher. And yet he was so filled with the Holy Spirit and had such a powerful ministry there in Chicago. And so in speaking about the Holy Spirit, he he quotes and and says this, A.W. Tozer, the idea of the Holy Spirit to the average church member is so vague as to be non-existent. Let me say that one more time. The idea of the Holy Spirit to the average church member is so vague as to be non-existent. And, and as such, there, there's this tension that rises up inside of us when we begin to try to comprehend the, the Holy Spirit. I've been mentioning these tensions all throughout this series. That what we tend to do with tensions, instead of embracing these tensions, is we evade them. We ignore them. We, we, we don't have a theological grid for them. Our minds can't fully comprehend them. So we end up placing it on the shelf and ignoring it altogether. And, and what I've been trying to do in this series is to help us actually embrace some of these tensions. To, to be okay in a place when you don't have all the answers. When you can't put it in a nice systematic theology. You can't put it in a nice clean little box. And, and so with this idea that the Holy Spirit to the average church member is so vague as to be non-existent, on the, on the flip side, there's these extremes. And so when, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, there, there's generally speaking two camps that churches fall in. And, and there's, there's more than two camps, but these are the two extremes, the two most popular. So on, on one side of, of the, the belief on the Holy Spirit, there's a group of people that refer to themselves as cessationists. Everybody say that with me, cessationists. Cessationists believe this idea that, that when, when the Holy Spirit fell upon the apostles, he, he worked in such a miraculous way to, to help really start the church. But then when, when the Bible came together, when they use a, a verse in Corinthians referring to the perfect. When the perfect came together, that, that the gifts ceased, that they stopped. And specifically, some of these more kind of miraculous type of gifts, like healings and, and words of knowledge and prophecy. And, and so these, these people refer to themselves as cessationists. Now, on the flip side, you have another group group of people that refer to themselves as sensationalists. Say that with me, sensationalists. So you have cessationists and then sensationalists. And then sensationalists, what what they are all about is really the the power of the Holy Spirit. I need more Holy Spirit power. I need the, the power. It's all about the power. It's like this force. I need some more Holy Ghost, as some may say. And and what they fail to to recognize is is, is the Holy Spirit's role really is to exalt Jesus, to exalt Christ, to exalt people back to him. And so they've gone so far to one side that, that it's all about the, the power and, and, and the miraculous that can happen in and through us without exalting Christ, the, the purpose of, of the Holy Spirit. And so, again, you have cessationists, then you have sensationalists, and you have everything in between. And so what I'm trying to, to get us to be okay with it is, is to try to find a happy medium in here somewhere. Because the problem with both of these positions, whether you're cessationist or sensationalist, is that the Bible speaks directly against both. That the Holy Spirit continues to work, continues to move, continues to heal, but it's not just about the power. It's not just about the, the dynamite. And so we have to, to look at what the scriptures say about the Holy Spirit. And, and really, 
when, when there's all these books and all these theologies and all these well-known pastors that write on the Holy Spirit, who better to learn about the Holy Spirit than Jesus? Right? Who better to learn about the Holy Spirit than Jesus? So, so if you have your Bibles today, I encourage you to turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. We're going to be digging into our Bibles today. Do, do, you, do you have your Bibles with you today? If you have your Bibles, hold them up in the air. Wave them all around like you just don't care. I see regular Bibles. I see some electronic Bibles. All right, turn to your neighbor and say, I hope you spend more time in the holy book than on Facebook. <laughs> Go ahead. John chapter 14. If you're at John chapter 14, get me a yeah. If you need more time, say, hold up. No, okay, okay. As some of you are flipping to John chapter 14, let me give you a little bit of a context of what's going on here. So uh, the last several weeks, I've been, I've been referencing some passages that are dealing with, with Jesus and his disciples. And, and where we are today in John chapter 14 is when they're in the upper room. Uh, and Jesus is teaching to the disciples in Jerusalem just days before everything bad goes, goes down. And so they're, they're in this upper room. They, they haven't yet had this last supper with Jesus. And, and Jesus is teaching and, and really having this deep discussion with his disciples, knowing that, that he, he's not going to have any more you know, talk with them before everything goes down with the cross and, and the suffering and the flogging. He, he's, he's trying to to teach them you know, what is it that they need to know before things go bad for them. And so this is the context of, of what's happening in John chapter 14. And in the beginning of John chapter 14, Jesus is talking about, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he's telling his disciples that, that you know where I'm going. I'm going to pr prepare a place for you that we've been even singing about that this morning. And, and that you, you will know the way. And Thomas is like, I, I, don't, I don't know the way. How, how do we get there? It's not coming up on my GPS. Like, wh where are we going? And then Andrew is saying, we'll, we'll believe you if you show us the Father. And, and Jesus said, well, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And, and here is where the context is in John chapter 14. And we're going to pick it up starting in verse 12. So John chapter 14, verse 12, it says this. Jesus speaking to his disciples, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, just in case you missed it the first time, I will do it. Right off the bat, we're faced with another tension. What do you, what do you mean? I'm going to be able to do the, the works that Jesus does. What do you mean that I'm going to be able to do even greater works than Jesus do, does? I mean, I don't know about, have you, you Andrew, Peter, James, did you, have you seen what Jesus has done? I mean, he is walking on water. He's feeding thousands and thousands of people with Two fish and five loaves. He, he's raising people from the dead. What do you mean that, that I'm going to be doing the works that Jesus does and even greater works than these? This is a tension that we even wrestle with today. Because I don't know about you, but I, I haven't risen anyone from the dead. Anybody? Anybody? I, I haven't walked on water. There's this tension that we're faced with. And, and, and you can try to explain it away. It, it, you know, he's not really talking about the, the same works that he did. Or he, he's more talking about it, it's in greater in number. Or, and, and I sit there and, and I, I hear these arguments. And yeah, that, that makes me feel okay. It makes me feel better about myself because I can't perform these miracles that Jesus performed. But that's not what Jesus says. He says, you will do the works that I do. And, and, and greater works than these will you do. These tensions that, that God is infinitely powerful yet intensely personal. That Jesus is fully heavenly and fully human. He is completely God and completely man. 
that God exists as a triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit. There's these tensions that we are faced with that we can't reconcile in our human finiteness. That if we believe in Jesus, we'll do greater works than Jesus? How can this be so? And rather than embracing this tension, we just evade it. And, and we just dismiss it. And, and we're okay not wrestling with it because, because then we're faced with, with, with just a problem when we're not seeing the things that Jesus did with his apostles and we're not seeing those here today. So, and, and what I want to challenge us with today is, is the reason why we should embrace it is because Jesus emphatically said it. Like, listen to what he says back in verse 12. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, like, pay attention, listen up. Let me say this so you can understand it. Let me, let me give you the God's honest truth. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And then, and then here we're faced with a second tension in the same sentence that he says, and greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Now, hold up, Jesus. You know, we, we've seen you do a lot of cool things. You, you've even allowed us to participate in some of these miracles and, and experience that firsthand, but, but now you're leaving? And, and you're saying, because you're leaving, I'm going to be able to do greater works? I, I don't have a grid for this, Jesus. This does not make sense. And here's what I hope tension does for us is that i hope tension really helps keep our attention that it forces us to dive into the scriptures to really study and to learn to to remain humble before god that that he would guide us in all truth that he would help us understand some of these truths especially when we're faced with tension i will do the same works as jesus and even greater works than these there's a little bit of a, a silly illustration, and, 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 and Jesus talking to his disciples that, that because I'm going to the Father, you'll, you'll do these even greater works. I, a couple of months ago, we have a trampoline in our backyard, and I'm out there with Dean and Shane and teaching them how to do flips on the trampoline. And, and they're picking it up pretty quickly, and, and I'm out there kind of teaching them how to do it, and, and hey, you really got to jump high and then tuck and and kick your kick your rear end with your feet to help you rotate around and and then stand up as you make that 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 rotation and and I'm there and, I, and I'm helping them to to learn and master master this flip and and then as soon as I leave they stop doing it because they, they don't have that confidence there and, I, and I'm imagining that's very similar to what the disciples are are going through they, they, they Jesus is telling them to do these things. You're going to do great works, but then it's, it's because I'm going to go that you're able to do these things. And well, what if, I need my coach. I need that confidence. I need that support system. Well, Jesus continues in verse 16, and he says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. One of the, the focus points I want us to get today is, in speaking about the Holy Spirit, is, is really, it's the Holy Spirit. He brings the reality of God's person, presence, and power to God's people. The Holy Spirit brings the reality of God's person, presence, and power to God's people. So let me start to unpack this a little bit, that, that the Holy Spirit is a person. You know, we have this vagueness about the Holy Spirit. We have this vagueness about the Holy Ghost, depending on, you know, the tradition that you grew up in and, and how you refer to him, that the Holy Spirit is a person. And, and I know for me growing up, I grew up in a context that... It was all about, you know, the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy KJV. We didn't talk about the Holy Spirit. And if we did talk about the Holy Spirit, it's more of the, the, the Holy Ghost. Notice, like, when you say Holy Spirit, you go up, and then when you talk about the Holy Ghost, it's Holy Ghost. 
and, and we would mention the Holy Ghost, but then we would retreat and go right back to the comfort of our KJV Bible, King James Version. Anybody? Anybody? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy KJV. But, but this is a thing that's been going on ever since the, the beginning of the church. This, this vagueness and this uncomfortableness with the Holy Spirit. You see, one of the reasons why the creeds even started is because these false teachers started infiltrating the church and, and teaching bad theology. And so in, in the early 300s, there was a guy by the name of Arius of Alexandria. There's this belief system known as Arianism that's kind of based on some of the beliefs that he taught. And what Arius of Alexandria taught is that God the Father created Jesus, God the Son. And that God the Father existed before Jesus was created. And then, and then God the Father and God the Son then created the Holy Spirit. So, so there was this inferiority, there is this, this hierarchy when it came to the triune God, when it came to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that God the Father was up top, created God the Son, and then them together creating the Holy Spirit. But this is a, a huge theological uh, uh, wrongdoing when it comes to the triune God. Even if you look at the very beginning of the Bible, in the beginning was, or I'm sorry, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the Spirit hovered over the earth. So what happened in 325 was there is this council that formed in Nicaea. And there all these church fathers came together to, to kind of put their beliefs and their thoughts in order in response to this false teaching that was coming up and rising up in the church by Arius. And so this is where you get some of these creeds, the Apostles' Creed, and then specifically from this council of Nicaea, the Nicene Creed. And you can see as you read through the Apostles' Creed, it's, it's very triune in its nature. It talks about God the Father, and it talks about God the Son, and it talks about God the Holy Spirit. And then the Nicene Creed kind of even unpacks it a little bit more and, and says how, the, how they're co-equal with one another. And so this has been an issue throughout the church since the beginning of the church. And then Arius specifically, when he, when he talked about the Holy Spirit, it, it, he talked about it in vague terms. And notice that I'm saying it because this is what he referred to the Holy Spirit as. It was this kind of supernatural force, this cosmic conscience. So today we, we even experience some of these extremes when we turn on the TV and we, we, we see the churches that that are, are preaching still from the King James Version. There's no, no Holy Spirit. There's no Holy Ghost. There's no influence of, of His moving, guiding, leading in our lives. But then we change to the next channel, and you got a guy with a coat waving it, and masses of stadiums fall over because of this Holy Ghost power that's knocking them down. Let's, let's see what Jesus teaches what he clearly teaches about the Holy Spirit, that, that he is a distinct person. Back to John chapter 14, verse 16 and 17, he says this, and I, that's Jesus, God the Son, second person of the Trinity, will ask the Father, that's God the Father, first person of the Trinity, and he will give you another helper. This is a reference to the Holy Spirit. Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. So even right there in that phrase, you have this triune God in our faces. I, the Son, will ask the Father about the Helper, the Holy Spirit, to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So it's this idea that the Holy Spirit is a, is a he. he. He is a person. It's not this, this force that empowers us, or it's not this cosmic conscience that, that we somehow can tap into. The Holy Spirit is a person. And as you continue to unpack the, the New Testament, we learn about all these different qualities of the Holy Spirit, these personalities. In verse 26 of John chapter 14, Jesus says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. And then in chapter 15, verse 26, Jesus again says, when the helper comes, 
uh, I, I will send him to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father. He will bear witness about me. He will testify about me, the Son, Jesus. And then he says in John chapter 16, verse 8, that when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. John chapter 16, verse 13, we learn that the Holy Spirit guides and he speaks further in, in the New Testament that, that the Holy Spirit has a mind, he has a will, he, he loves, the Holy Spirit can be grieved in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, that the Holy Spirit prays on our behalf, he gives gifts. All of these are attributes of, of people, that if, if the Holy Spirit is grieved, he's saddened by our rejecting him, that, that, that that's a personal quality, a, a force. A cosmic conscience isn't going to be offended if we reject him. That the Holy Spirit loves, that is a, it's an attribute of personality. So the first thing that we learn is that the Holy Spirit is a distinct person. And this is why when we talk about Christianity, that Christianity is so much more than a religion. Christianity is is a relationship with this triune God of the universe, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and that he is infinitely powerful, and yet he is intensely personal. That he wants to have a relationship with us as his sons and daughters. It's, it's no longer a set of do's and don'ts that, that get us favor or right standing with God. It's, it's accepting the gift that, that Jesus died for our sins and that he rose again. And as we place our faith and trust in him, the Holy Spirit indwells us. And we begin this personal relationship with the God of the universe. So the Holy Spirit is a distinct person. It's not an it. And this is where some of our vagueness comes up even as a church and, and why we have so many different variances and positions on the Holy Spirit because, because we, we kind of refer to him as an, an it, even in just calling him the Holy Spirit. Well, when we say God the Father, it's, it's you know, God the Father, there's this fatherly figure, he, he is a he, and, and God the Son, the Son, he, it's a he, but then the Holy Spirit, we, we kind of allow ourselves to drift away from the truth that he is a person. But then the Holy Spirit also reveals the reality of God's divine presence. I'm reminded of the prayer that King David prayed in, in Psalm chapter 139. He says, where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. There's this theological term that we use in the church called ob omnipresence. It's the idea that, that God is everywhere, always, and always everywhere. Again, this, this tension that, that God is, he's, he's everywhere. Like, he's, he's here. He's, he's on the other side of the world even now as we speak. He, he's everywhere. He's omnipresent. And there's this tension that we wrestle with because it, that just short circuits our mind as we try to unpack that and, and put that into our theological grids. The Holy Spirit is with us. Listen to what Jesus says back in John chapter 14. He says, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, if you circle or underline in your Bible, circle that word with, that he will be with you you forever even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him we even sang this morning spirit come down and and, and we sometimes even have to explain what we're singing when we sing that word because because even as we enter into this place the, the spirit's already here he's already present with us but when we sing, Spirit, come down, we're really saying, hey, Spirit, show yourself in a fresh new way. Reveal yourself as your people come together and sing praises and, and want to learn from you. Would you reveal yourself in a fresh new way? And so Jesus says, I am sending the helper to be with you 
forever. See, there, there is this shift that happened from the Old Testament to the New Testament. That, that Jesus, being fully human and, and fully God, in his humanness, there, there was some geographical limitations to his abilities. And even saying that, that I don't fully have a theological grid for this because, because knowing that he's fully human and fully God, he, he should be able to, to do whatever he wants anytime he wants, whether he is here or, or not. But, but while he ministered here on the earth, th- there was something about him ministering in this region of Galilee and Judea. And, and if you wanted healing, you had to go to Jesus and you had people kind of grabbing onto the hem of his garments to, to try to get some of this healing. And, and there are a couple of examples, yes, when Jesus heals from a distance, but, but there's still, there's something about in his humanness while he was here on earth that he was limited in a way, that you had to be in his presence in order to receive the blessing. But then he says, I'm going to go and and I'm going to send another helper, another helper like me. And he is going to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth. So so the Holy Spirit is now with us. We're no longer reliant on on Jesus' physical presence here and now right beside us, that the Holy Spirit is fulfilling that on his behalf. But not only is he with us, the Holy Spirit is now with us. In us, listen to what he says in verse 17. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. He dwells with you and will be in you. When you study the Old Testament and specifically God's people, the people of of Israel, God promises to Israel that, that he would be for Israel and, and with Israel, but he wasn't in Israel. As you look through the Old Testament, God very um, uh, purposely manifested himself in certain ways. And so when, when the Israelites were, were being uh, escaping from Egypt, God's presence was revealed through a, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And then as they started wandering the wilderness, the, the Israelite people, they, they put this traveling tabernacle in place and, and God's presence dwelt amongst the holy of holies in this tabernacle. And then eventually this, this tabernacle is transitioned to the temple in Jerusalem, again to where this, there is this holy of holies. This is, this is where God's presence dwelt in the ark of the holy of holies and there were only very limited people that could enter into the presence of god the high priest of israel and even entering into the presence of god they had to go through a series of ceremonial cleansings there there were all these rules around being in the presence of god and yet jesus is starting to say here starting to to give the disciples a, a forewarning hey hey the The presence of God is no longer going to be limited to a building, but he's now going to be in your body. That the Holy Spirit is going to be in you. Of all the mighty truths associated with our redemption through Jesus Christ, perhaps the apex of the reality of our redemption is that God himself, through the Holy Spirit, makes his home in our bodies. When we talk about our beliefs as Christians, you've heard me use this phrase that our beliefs ought to influence our behaviors. God's presence dwells in me. God's presence dwells in you. His holy presence, his all-powerful presence dwells in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. If we truly believe that, that would influence every behavior from this point forward. How we interact with our spouses, how we interact with our friends, how we interact with our neighbors, how we interact with our co-workers, how we interact with one another here on this room. That the belief that now the Holy Spirit dwells in us as Christians, that ought to change everything about us and how we behave and how we live. You see, the God who is for you, the God who is 
with you and the God who is in you, he is for you, he is with you, and he is in you because he wants to do something greater through you. The God who is for you, the God who is with you, the God who is in you wants to do something even greater through you. So John, one of Jesus' apostles, he says this, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And then Paul, that, that famous saint, that, that the man who once persecuted the church but now was one of the biggest proponents of the church, he says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will give also life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. That the infinite God of the universe makes his home inside of us. That ought to change everything about us. Everything. That it's, it's no longer just him being present. That, that, that the, the spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in me. That creates a tension for me. It creates a tension for me. Colleen and I were even praying last night. God, help me, to, help me to understand this. I don't have the capability to put this in a neat little box. He says, embrace it. Study it. Pursue it. Chase after it. Don't give up on it. And, and here is this tension that, that that spirit who raised Jesus from the dead, that he lives inside of me, that he resides in me, but I don't feel like an all-powerful, all-loving, all merciful, all gracious, all faithful, God is making his presence in my body. I don't feel that. How do I reconcile this? I'm, I'm afraid to act. I'm afraid to step out. I'm afraid to get outside of my comfort zone for, for fear of him not moving like I know he can move. I'm afraid to, to take that step of faith, not not knowing if he's, he's actually going to, in faith, do what I'm asking him to do. I, I've, I've laid hands on people and prayed for their healing, and they haven't been healed. I, I've asked for, for blessing to come upon people, and, and they, they haven't been blessed, at least in, in my understanding of what blessing ought to be. How do we reconcile all of this? I'm not seeing these greater works in my life that Jesus emphatically says, truly, truly, I say to you, listen up, pay attention. How do we reconcile all of this? John chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. Things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. It's this interesting word, this word teach, he, it comes from the Greek word meaning the dasko, and, and, or I'm sorry, it comes from the Greek word dasko, meaning to hold the discourse in order to instruct. And so the Holy Spirit is, is in a way conversing with us as he's teaching us all things and, and allowing us to remember all that he has taught us. Have you ever been in a situation when, when you're praying to the Holy Spirit and you're like, oh, I, I, just, I need a word. I, I don't know how to talk to this person right now. I don't know how I want to encourage this person. I, I need a verse. I, I can't. And then all of a sudden it comes. That's the Holy Spirit. And, and as I tried to illustrate how this works for us as Christians, I, I remember back to, to my former worship leading days, and, and one of the things that, that you all experience on, on a Sunday morning as, as the band is up here and, and leading us in worship and, and you being out there is that, is that we, we hear what's coming out of the speakers, that we hear, we hear the drums, we hear the keyboard, we, we hear the guitars, we hear the, the voices of those who are singing. And, and for us, it, it looks polished, it looks well done, it, it, it's this 
this, this music that's moving us into the presence of God, but there's, there's things that are happening in the background that, that you're probably unaware of. And so as a worship leader, we, we would often use, and, and bands we would often use, and even our team here up on Sundays sometimes uses what's called click and loop tracks. I'm going to play you a little bit of a sample of, of what they're hearing. Sometimes people ask, like, why do you guys have these ear things in your, is it, it's too loud, right? You're trying, to, you're trying to block out the sound because it's too loud. No, 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 no. That's not what happened. Dwayne, why, can you play that track here for a second just so, you, so all of us here can kind of hear what the band hears on Sunday? One, two, three, four. Intro. There's a rhythm. Here we are in the song. The introduction of the song. Praying during the song. Verse. Oh, okay. Verse. Walking around these walls. I thought by now they'd fall. I can't remember the name. Okay. Verse. Oh, gotta do it again. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Walking around these walls, I thought by now they fall. Da 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 da. The spirit's moving in me. What do I chorus. do next? Oh, okay. Chorus. Promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. There's a rhythm. There's instruction. There's guidance. Leading. Interlude. Okay. Let me just rest for a little bit. This is all happening as as the team is playing and singing for us. And it's very similar to, to what our lives ought to look like with the Holy Spirit. That we're tuned in to what he's telling us to do. That when we're going about our lives in the rhythm of the Spirit, we're, we're praying, we're reading God's word, and, and then all of a sudden he says, hey, make a left turn. Okay, I'm making a left turn. And, um, oh, and look, here's a person that needs prayer. Would you pray, pray for that person? Okay, I'm going to pray for this person. And we, we continue to go on in, in the rhythm that God has set for us. And, and before you know it, he he says, hey, oh, here's another person. Would you pray for oh, Okay, I'm going to pray for this person. And this time, I, I want you to be a little bit more bold. I want you to, to pray for, for blessing upon this person. Okay, I'm going to pray for blessing upon this person. And, and then all of a sudden, there's blessing that occurs. And, and then there's the interlude, and we just rest in his presence. We allow him to speak to us and to fill us up and, and, and try to tune into what he's doing and and then, and then the chorus comes. It's, it's time to, to actually move in a bigger way that, 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 that oh, th there's two promotions before me. Which one do I take? It's Holy Spirit, okay, I'm, I'm feeling like you're, you're, you're causing me to go this direction, so I'm going to go this direction because you're faithful. You haven't let me down yet. You see, this is, this is what it's like to, to live a life in the Spirit that we're in tune with Him every second of every day, and, and we're simply just following His directions. We're following His orders. We're following His promptings and His, his leadings, all while we're in rhythm with what He's doing. I don't know if you picked up on it, but when we opened up in John chapter 14, there was actually a verse that I left out, and and if the Holy Spirit brings the reality of God's presence and power to God's people, then, the, then I would say that the prescription for the presentation of God's presence and power in our lives is obedience. Listen to what Jesus says. John chapter 14, verse 15, the verse I left out. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father... And he will give you another helper to be with you forever. The prescription for God's presence and power in our lives is our obedience. If 
you love me, you will keep my commandments. And, and we're not obeying because we are wanting something more. We are obeying because we love him, because he first loved us. We recognize that we were far from God. There was no hope for us to be restored to God. But by his great love and his great mercy, he sent his son to die for me, to take on my sin, to take on a death that I should have died. And now that he's taken on that death, he, he, he rose from the grave so that I too might live to newness of life that I am going to love him, and, and because of my love for him, I will obey him. Not, I'm, I'm not obeying just so I can, can continue to climb higher and, and see greater things to occur, or, or even just obey because I'm, I'm trying to get even better standing with God. No, no, I obey because I love. He first loved me. Here's my challenge for us as a church. When it comes to the Holy Spirit, I believe the Holy Spirit still wants to move. I believe that he has shown himself faithful, that he is for us, that he is with us, that he is in us in order that he might do something greater through us. And if we surrender to him, we submit to him, we stay in tune with him, we move when he says move, we pray when he says pray, if we would simply obey him because of the love that we have for him, I guarantee we are going to see things, experience things that are going to completely blow our minds. Not, not because we get to say that we were part of it, but so that it magnifies our risen King, Jesus Christ. He is our Savior. He is our Lord. He died for us, and He lives so that we might live. Let's stand together as we submit to His authority.